بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومسيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا نتجد له وليا مرشدا um, Of course last time we talked about various topics but today inshallah we're, we're going to be continuing um, the second session of it uh, the second session or the fourth session of it actually and part of uh, the adab of Talib al-Ilm to continue, uh, we mentioned last time, is mentioning the stories of the pious people. And when we say mentioning the stories of the pious people, we said that that motivates us to, to act like them, that motivates us to at least know that this is my role model, this is who I want to be like. And especially uh, living in, in the U.S., uh, we rarely see good role models. We mostly see people that are not very practicing and they tend to be the popular ones all right and the ones that are not practicing tend to be the popular ones the ones that are uh the ones that are uh you could say imitating or in that between in that between position where what i mean by the in between more more acting in that postmodern culture and putting that postmodern culture in their lifestyle and acting as if it was Islam is what was right now considered popular. Um, you're not going to be popular if you're not going to be if you're not going to be acting in that postmodern culture. And there's a lot there that that can be said about postmodern culture. But for now, I want to just focus on talking about this. Inshallah, just like the that what Umar ibn al-Khattab said reduce or uh, eliminate evil by not talking about it and which is something very important in order for you to remove evil in order for you to uh, downsize evil don't talk about it don't even if you want to mention it try to mention the good try to mention the acts of the salihin instead of mentioning and talking about what what the what the non or let me say the the non salihin are doing because what happens is is that when you actually talk about it even if you want to talk about it as as uh in a way to uh, in a way to help others or encourage others to avoid it what is even a better technique to encourage others to avoid these evil things is by mentioning the good uh by mentioning the the good examples Eliminating whether the, the evil actions or eliminating even talking about the, the people that are not good examples. Talk about the salihin. Talk about even the living salihin. I know that generally, I know that generally in our own society, we cannot talk about somebody necessarily or guarantee somebody's salah or somebody's piety if they are living because don't overpraise a living being because the person that is living you cannot guarantee that they will not come across a fitna that will take them back or reveal the reality of their hearts don't overpraise a living being. In fact, there is a hadith that actually warns us and tells us that if you um, overpraise a living being, it's like you had uh, put dust or thrown dust at their face. You blindfolded them from seeing from seeing their own sins. And this is something very important because a lot of times we don't know the living people and what kind of fitna they might go through. And that's why even the Sahaba, uh, even the Sahaba, they used to be afraid of a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ actually said uh, that somebody uh, can do the actions of Ahlul Jannah. In another narration, as to what it appears to people. To the point that there's no distance between him and Jannah except the dhira. The dhira is, is pretty much like a, uh, an arm, an arm size. 
than what has been predestined, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, had previous knowledge about that. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have previous knowledge about that? Remember, time encompasses human beings, encompasses living things, but time doesn't encompass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-alim al-khabir, is al-alam al-ghuyub, is al-alam al-ghuyub, he is the one that knows the past and the, and the, the past and the, and the future. Why? Because time does not encompass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So time is not something that is, that, um, that acts as an obstacle from, for, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from knowing what's going to happen in the future. But it is to you. Because you don't know what's going to happen in the future unless the time comes for you to meet it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, time does not encompass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond time. Part of nature, part of nature is time. Part of nature are the different dimensions. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not part of nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond nature. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala time is not something that is of any difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the past and the future, the exact same knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not increase knowledge by time, but we do. Because we're human, we're, we're weak. Now, اقضوا على الشر بعدم ذكره How did we get there? اقضوا على الشر بعدم ذكره Why did we talk about time? I forgot. Um, talking about pious people generally. Oh, uh, the fitna for the, for, uh, for the t- praising people. That's why. Yeah. Now, why are we not supposed to be praising people? Because generally, like I said, the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ, um, actually said in the hadith that somebody can do the action of the Ahlul Jannah. Then what was predestined will actually take place because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have the barrier of time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what the, the, the future and the, the past. And that's why it doesn't affect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what, um, what, um, uh, or experience, or time, or history. Now, speaking of that, but it is also good to mention to mention the good the, the good things of our pious people, even if they are living, as a place of encouragement, as a way of encouraging others. For example, you know a sister, for example, that's taking care of five orphans, for example. And you say, well, this sister is taking care of five orphans. She's doing this in order to encourage others. But don't say it in front of her. In order to preserve her ikhlas, her sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll tell you, um, sisters, this is, this is real. I'll tell you, when I first started, um, when I first started my Sharia college, Sharia degree, when you first start, you you get a sense of pride in yourself. You get a sense of, uh, you get a sense that, especially that you, you actually got to know most of the questions that you had on your mind. And you pretty much start getting a feeling to look down at others. This is, wait up. And this is something that a lot of times we may fall into. You can look down at others when you see what others are doing. But be careful. It isn't until I started teaching, and I started teaching in Masjid al-Aqsa, and I used to teach it in Masjid al-Aqsa. I taught in Masjid al-Aqsa for some time. It isn't until I started teaching in Masjid al-Aqsa that I realized that many, that I at one point looked down at because I thought they did not have the hadith that I thought that I had. Or I looked down at because I thought, well, they still need to get uh, better in their Islam, etc. And it isn't until later I discovered that when I dealt with people, that there were many people out there that have less in but are better than me. 
that have less in but have better sincerity. It's not about how much in you have. It's about the sincerity. Somebody can have less in and actually have better khushua. Somebody can be less practicing or as to what it appears to you. But you realize that practice being or practicing or considered religious is not necessarily as to how many layers you're covering. I'm not saying hijab is not obligatory. No, hijab is obligatory and it is part of what enhances our iman and it is part of what enhances our spirituality. But a lot of times we, we may focus on the outside and not and not work on the inside. It's easier to focus on the outside. It's a lot easier to focus on the outside. Simple, all you, all you need to do is get another layer of niqab. That's all it needs. Another hijab, another mandil, another hijab for three minutes. You may think that, oh, that's all it needs. Sure, I'll wear a coat too. But not necessarily what it takes. It's working on your heart is harder than working on the outside. Why? Because it requires sincerity. Because it requires a moment of facing your own desires, or your own hawa. Because it takes a moment for you to realize the reality of your own self. And we don't want to realize the reality of our own selves. Because our ego steps in, our shaitan steps in to convince us that we're better. And that's why we become defensive when somebody else is criticizing us. We always think we're the center. We always, whenever we are at fault in something, no, we always want to con convince ourselves that we have a good excuse for it. And subhanAllah, I mean, without us realizing, without us realizing when we're just, we're just glued to our books or glued to learning, we may think at one we may think at one point that fasadness. We may think that everybody had 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 become fasad, everybody had become bad, evil, lacking religiosity. There's a hadith where the Prophet actually said it has two narrations. Man qala halak al nas fa huwa ahlakuhum. There's another narration, faqad ahlakahum. Both interpretations actually have a totally different meaning. Number one is that whoever said that people are destructed, he's the one that destructed them. And the other interpretation, whoever said that people are destructed, then he's the one, then he's the one that's the most destructed out of all of them. Scary, huh? This is very important because a lot of times we may think, oh, everybody is fasted. You know, that's actually not, that's actually not true. There are many people out there. And in fact, when I say, it's very important, although indeed, there is lots of fitna. And I'll tell you at least here in America, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the times that I have seen people that at one point, this week, niqab and hijab and covering her face and covering all her body and so keen about this is bid'ah and that's not bid'ah. And then a week later, she's all tattoos and all piercing. I have never seen this at least anywhere else in the world where the person is salih one day and salih the other day. And this is really scary. And I've only seen it here. And especially during our time today. Our times that within these past 10 years. That is a, this is the most time that I've seen where the Prophet ﷺ actually said, That a person will wake up mu'min and sleep kafir. Sleep kafir and wake up mu'min. This is the most time that I see it now. That she's movement today and a week later you're seeing her. What happened? How did she? A major flip. 
And that's why we should always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the best. You could never guarantee anybody anybody's deed. You can never guarantee your own deed. But it's it's very important, even though you cannot guarantee anybody's deed, it's also still good to encourage us to by by talking about the good out there. By speaking about the good out there. There's a sister, mashallah, she finished the, memorizing the Qur'an. There's another shaykha with Asha Qur'an, with 10 Qur'an. There's this shaykha that, that specialized in, in, in such and such. Or this, this sister that's a mom, has five kids, and all of them thought half of Qur'an. This is, it's out there. It's out there. Let's not think that it's not out there. No, there are many women that, uh, that I, have, I have seen. Women that have children were able to were, were able to actually make their kids become hafal, all of them hafal, or become or excel even in school, excel in in so many different ways. It's not impossible. In fact, the sad fact or the sad thing that I have encountered is may Allah subhanahu wa taala preserve my own kids and preserve. Um, and, and preserve my own family, say um, is that unfortunately a lot of those that work in da'wah, whether it's shiyukh or shaykhat, unfortunately the ch their children are the most ones that are far away from me. It's very sad. Why? Because a lot of times from what I realize is that a lot of times the people that are teaching or the people that are studying may be so focused on their own their own teaching and their own classes that they might forget their own their uh, their own kids or their own family or even implementing it on ground. In other words, they're so focused on giving classes about sabr and sincerity that they forgot to review themselves with it. This is very scary. It's so easy to give a, a halaqa or a lesson or a class about sabr, patience, but sabr is not a class or a halaqa to talk about. It's hardship to live. When you say it's hardship to live, it's Something that um, I remember, this is just a story, I don't know if they're listening. But I, I'll tell you, it was, it was so hard for me one time. I had one of my students actually got cancer. She's a five-year-old girl. Had cancer and till this day, I mean, I must admit, um, I remember that moment when she got cancer and I was asked to make dua and all that, I couldn't, I couldn't hold myself really. I couldn't hold myself because of the, mag, the, the great sabr that the parents had. Because I imagined myself, if God forbid anything happens at least close to this, I don't know if I will have that sabr. The father, I don't know if he's listening to me, but the father, um, especially and the mother both, when the when the girl I was I went to their home and the girl was lying down on bed. Both the father and the mother are doctors. And the father, because he specialized in the respiratory system or something like that, he did the, the did the tests and then takes the x-ray and realizes that after doing all the different chemotherapy and bone marrow and all that that the girl uh, that the chemotherapy and all the all the different treatments that they were trying to do wasn't going to work or it didn't work so takes the x-ray and then looks at the x-ray and then realizes that his daughter, his five-year-old daughter, 
only has two weeks to live. Takes the x-ray, takes out all the machines, tells his wife, let's go home. Take your daughter, she's only got two weeks to live. This is real suffering. I don't know, it's so easy, it's such an easy word, I'll tell you. These are not mothers, but inshallah you will be mothers. There's nothing. A mother would, for a mother, feeling the pain herself is, is easier on, on her than seeing her child feel the pain. Yet the father, the mother who's a dentist, looks at the daughter and Yes, because of her specialty being a dentist and not a respiratory doctor. She looks at the daughter and and she's realizing that the doctor is, that, that her daughter is breathing in a hard way. But the father just says, Look at your daughter, she's taking her last breaths. I don't know how he was able to say these words. To actually look at his own daughter taking her last breath and not and just hold not be able to do anything and just right there watch his own daughter take her last breath till finally she dies and I go to their house and beautiful very beautiful house and the girl is lying right down there on the bed everybody is just looking at her she's bald and five-year-old girl and holding their tears until the dad asked me, is it okay for me to cry? And it is okay for you to cry. That's when he didn't scream, but cried. But the cries just tells you how much of sabr he had, thinking that it was, it wasn't, he wasn't allowed to cry. Goes and, is it okay for me to kiss her, my own daughter? Lying down right there on the bed. Then goes and says, it's okay to kiss your daughter. Goes and starts hugging her and all that, but with great sorrow. Great, great, great sorrow. Didn't scream, didn't faint, didn't all that. And just said, This is great sorrow. To actually, it's, I'll tell you, I mean, it's a, it's a lesson for me. It teaches me how to be humble. Because true Iman, it's not about the class that you teach. It's not the halakha. It's easy to memorize. It's easy to memorize verses of the Quran. And easy to memorize words of Sahaba and quotes, hadith. And it's very easy to memorize. And that's why, because when you deal with people, you, and this is part of, part of um, Iman elevation and spirituality elevation, is that when you take the moment to deal with, with the people, you realize that there are many out there that are a lot better than, than what you actually thought. There are many, no, there are some different. There are Salihim. There are Salihim men. There are Salihim women. Don't, ima don't imagine and don't let this, the, the things that are out there talking about domestic violence tell you that, okay, there's, there's no way that there's going to be a Salih brother. No, there are Salihim brothers. And just like you see out there, same thing for the brothers. You say, there are Salihim women too. Don't be fooled by all the fitna that's outside and think that it doesn't exist. No, there is life. And there is life. There are good people out there. And that's why it's very important to actually bring those examples for us to learn. For us to take and for us to see that some of these people, that some of these people out there that you once prejudged that they were that there were people that were going to be destructed. You then become humble and you realize that I need to learn from them. 
you, re you realize that ilm, it's not just memorizing things, but ilm is a sincerity in the heart. Ilm is a sincerity in the heart. When does sincerity in the heart when do you see it reflecting? When real fitna comes. When real fitna comes. The fitna can be in many ways. The fitna that she couldn't find the right brother to get married to. So Shaitan is convincing her that, you know, if only you reduce your hijab, if only you put more makeup on, etc. Or the brother, it's because you um, don't have, you're not focused on your dunya. And the list goes on and on. And the fitna can be in, in, in money, the fitna can be in health, the fitna can be in looks, the fitna can be where it can convince you that it's only this, this obstacle or Islam is your obstacle or haram is your obstacle and it's so sad that right now we're getting a lot a lot of different things that are trying to shut down shut down doing da'wah or al-amr bin ma'ruf and nahan munkar ordering for what is good and forbidden what is evil by labeling anybody that does da'wah by labeling anybody that does da'wah as haram police or anybody that does da'wah as extreme, boring, being judgmental without, without us realizing that a lot of times these types of, these types of words are really, just, are really just coming out from a postmodern philosophy that regards that there is no truth that regards there is no standard to, to base your definition on. Therefore, you cannot call something right or wrong. Therefore, the second that you call something right, you have considered a particular thing being wrong, then you have been condescending to others. So you're realizing we're taking in this philosophy and then unfortunately many are out there taking this type of philosophy and telling you it's supported by Islam. MashaAllah. This is something that's very that's very common right now. Uqdu ala sharri bi adami dhikri he does not mean do not do da'wa do not do da'wa or amr of ma'ruf and na'am munkar Uqdu ala sharri bi adami dhikri he by not talking about evil and you're replacing it by talking about the good by talking about the salihin or those nahsabuhum kadhalik those that they seem to us from the salihin in order for us to take them as good examples Part of, um, we were again still talking about the adab for Talib al -Hal. Avoid silliness and act with dignity and self esteem. And this is extremely very important. I believe we talked about it last time uh, in the postmodern and especially, especially in the American culture, um, it's considered as being cool. Or not having an attitude if you're actually acting silly or joking too much it's considered that you are fun you're cool without you realizing um, without you realizing this actually takes many into acting silly and losing their muru'a what is muru'a? muru'a is having dignity and honor and respect. Part of muru'a, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasized for women. And do not 
speak with khudu' bil qalb. I'm going to talk about khudu' bil qalb. Fat ma'al ladhi fi qalbihi marat. Fayat ma al ladhi fi qalbihi marat. Do not speak in khudu' bil qalb. What is khudu' bil qalb? Khudu' bil qalb is speaking whether in a way whether it's for example making your voice uh, too feminine if you would want or laughing loudly for example al-khudu' bil qawl can also be in joking or over chatting for example when men are around al-khudu' bil qawl is of course an exception وَقُلْنَ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا what is what are you what are women ordered to say قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا say what is good why وَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ why not to have that that type of lenience in voice فَيَطْمَعُ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ because many that will have diseases in their hearts might actually take advantage. Although, pay attention to this. Do the majority have diseases in their hearts or not? If you look at the ayah, meaning that the majority, because it, 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 it put in that that is a singular, meaning the majority are supposed to be not concerned about the way you, about the talk. Majority. But some, some will actually have the diseases in their heart and try to take advantage of you. And because some, even one, is too many. Even one is a big number in somebody taking advantage of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلْنَ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا And only say, قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Good talk. Serious talk. Not loud or joking when men are in public, etc. Now here, when we say avoiding something, we're talking about speaking in a manner that also brings muru'a, also brings haiba. What is haiba? Also brings haiba dignity, respect. So when the man that is that that is hearing you will think many times and know that this isn't a woman that I can mess with. Because all he sees from you is a serious, honorable, in a respectable woman. He's not going to come across. And that's when we say Haybet, especially. Now this doesn't mean that you necessarily are going to be like that at all times. Alright? It's okay as women. It's okay to actually act your own feminine hood around your husband. At home. When our mahram men are all right, it's it's okay. But when manan mahram men are around, the, the ayah is clear. You cannot have khudur al-qawl at that time. Waqulna qawl al But when non mahram men are around, women, just a women's setting, you can actually, you could say, act yourself. But does it, acting yourself doesn't mean overdoing it with silliness. Why? Because every single word that they say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لديه رقيب عتيب. We have somebody supervising and watching every single word that they're saying. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described Jannah, Jannah لا تسمع فيها لا غير. Why لا تسمع فيها لا غير? You do not hurt, you, do, you cannot hear لا what is lahu? Lahu is also that that type of 
that type of silliness. Lahu can can go in different um, in different categories. Lahu, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually described al mu'mineen that walladina hum an lahwi mu'radu that they stay away from lahu. What is lahu? Lahu can be in silly talk, can be in haram talk, can be in talk that is not beneficial. Can be in talk that is not beneficial. And this is something unfortunately that we mostly actually see in our in our in our life where it's just it's just being too silly. It doesn't mean that or let me say it's um, the Salihin, or even in the book, it's called Mukhtasar Min Hajj Al Qasidi. That book is translated Mukhtasar Min Hajj Al Qasidi, um, and he mentions that he mentions that the amount of joking you want in your life is the amount of salt you put on food. Let's put a little bit of salt. Not too much. But unfortunately, in the postmodern world right now, it's actually the opposite. That amount of seriousness is most of the talk. Tasadihin used to say, Summiya al Muzaha Muzahan, Lena Huzaha Sahibihi an al Ha. The word Muzah, Muzah, actually comes from it actually means to joke but you don't actually see it like if you look at the if you look at the word here muzah it actually comes from the verb zaha zaha actually means to move to move and here they said they said the word muzah or be joking actually comes from the root zaha because it moved the person, the person that is joking, from truthfulness, from being just, from being honorable. And this is, this is unfortunately very common during our, our time today. Al Ahnaf ibn Qay, who was one of the Tabini, he never met the Prophet, but he lived during the time of the Prophet. Ahnaf ibn Qais. Um, he was known, and in fact, the Prophet ﷺ made dua for Ahnaf ibn Qais, even though he never met him. Ahnaf ibn Qais, here's a small story about Ahnaf ibn Qais. Ahnaf ibn Qais was in his, in, his, um, in his tribe, like in his city, and he hears from the Sahaba somebody making da'wah. The other people were mocking him, or mocking the Sahaba. So Al-Ahnaf ibn Qais starts telling the people, he's just telling you, why are you mocking him? So the Sahabi later goes to the Prophet ﷺ and tells him there's a guy named Al-Ahnaf ibn Qais and that he was actually following me and he was telling people, don't mock him, he's saying something good. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma ghfir, Allahumma ghfir li-Ahnaf. Ya Allah, uh, uh, forgive Al-Ahnaf. Now Al-Ahnaf never got to meet the Prophet But at least he got the dua. At least he got the dua. Imagine you guys, Ya Allah, having the Prophet make dua for you. Amazing, imagine. The Prophet making dua for you. Reminds me of the story of Julaybi. You guys know the story of Julaybi? Yeah. With the Prophet just a few days ago, nobody wanted to get him married. Why? Because he wasn't handsome and he was too ugly. This is something to teach girls. That when you want to choose a husband, you don't choose him for the, for the looks. You choose him for his deen. The deen may be, may be even something that will take you to gym. Right? And then the Prophet ﷺ holds him and he says, Julaybi mumini wa anamin. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ actually saying this about Julaybi, or saying this about you. And he said, Al-Ahnaf ibn Qais said, Kathratu al-Dahaki tudhibu al-Haybah. 
too much laughter takes away the person's heva, takes away the person's honor. Takes away the person's honor. So don't over laugh too much. Even the walk of the Prophet ﷺ had heva, had honor. With a person that, that heva also has an, another, another meaning where it gives people respect to you. So for Talib al -ilm and for the person that, that, that is teaching him, they have to have hayba. They have to have honor when they, when they teach, they ha when they practice in their life. Because too much laughter is going to let others take advantage of you. The best way to have honor is reducing talk. Don't talk too much. The more you talk, the more mistakes you make. The more mistakes you make, the less you'll hear to gain in. The more you talk, the more mistakes you, you will make. The more mistakes you make, and the more you talk, the less you'll hear in. Hayba also comes with having others. When we say give you honor, meaning that they're afraid to transgress their limits. Pastors. And this is especially, especially important 